Welcome to another segment of Beyond the Grassy you Knoll. All we have with us, uh, once again, the I-Man. A uh, new book coming out that we're going to talk about in a little bit. Uh, the title, as you might remember from the last time we had him on, we mentioned it, The Constitution for the United States, The Myth and the Reality, Just Who Owns the United States. Also, you can read many of his writings and also those of James Montgomery on ATG for Against the Grain, atgpress.com. Just click on the informer. If you get past the uh, the people that they feature on the, on the home page, you'll be okay. And I said that, not you. So how you doing, I man? Oh, not too bad. Pretty, doing pretty good. All right. Uh, before we get into the book, uh, I wanted to run two things by that has got people uh, all excited. Okay. One is that uh, twenty some odd states, I guess, have uh, you know filed resolutions or whatever in the, in the House. I I would assume in their respective state houses uh, that they're going to declare their sovereignty. And two things about that, I mean, I just want you to comment on it. First of all, I figured the 10th Amendment gave them that anyway. Um, it may be that the feds got more overreaching, but there was always things left to the states to decide for themselves, and that usually was speed limits and drinking ages and abortion and all this. Um, but I can't, and some of them may not take the stimulus package, but as far as I can see, if, if what you've said is correct, and that is, the Constitution is a compact between the federal government and the several states, being somewhat, I guess, companies of the larger corporation, they're never getting out of this. No, they're not. Uh, all the <clears throat> all the states uh, actually uh, gener were generated from the breakup of the Virginia Land Company that ran from Georgia in the south all the way up to the St. Lawrence Seaway and from the Atlantic Ocean over as far as Ohio. That was all the Virginia Company. That was called Virginia. And uh, when those particular territories in the Virginia Colony broke up, they formed what is called the states. Um, well, they were colonies, but they were actually a states of the king. Because what they did is they they made uh, a state right. into the word state, and when they wrote their constitutions, um, they had actually stated in in their own constitution that um, they could not, you know, after the Civil War is when they wrote the constitution <clears throat> um, for present day rule. And that is that um, they cannot secede from any union. All right. Well, <clears throat> that was that was going to be my second question. I think a lot of folks are believing that this is the beginning of a move to have some states secede from the union. And so, yeah, again, uh, you you know, you're not going anywhere. You're not going to no. violate the contract first of all, and second of all. Would you just uh, expand on that? Because it was my understanding, too, though I didn't know where I could find it, that the United States government was never, the federal government, was never going to let this thing happen again. Uh, yeah, they, um, uh, in fact, in the Constitution of North Carolina, I do have it right in front of me, and in Section 5 it says, Allegiance to the United States. Every citizen of the state owes paramount allegiance to the Constitution and government of the United States, and no law or ordinance of the state in contravention or subdivision thereof can have any binding force. So why are these states going to secede when their constitution forbids them to secede? That, that, yeah. I, but they just can't. And there's also a practical factor here, too. We're going to talk about business, which is what it all comes down to, the money. Yeah, it's, it's all corporations. In other words, um, they're just a corporation, and it's just like... Chevrolet saying, oh, well, we're going to secede from General Motors and we're going to have our own corporation. I mean, it's, it's that simple. It's that basic. Well, and it also gets into other things, too, and that is the states are so, it seems to me, inextricably tied into the federal coffers. I mean, what would the cutoff of funds do? Now, I believe Montana, maybe back in the 70s or sometime, uh, told the feds it's ridiculous for us to go to 55 miles an hour because if anybody's ever been on I-90 in Montana, you couldn't get into an accident even if you tried. 
Right. <laughs> so it was kind of ridiculous. But anyway, mm-hmm. apparently, as the story goes, if I remember this correctly, Montana said, okay, if you're not going to give us funds to the DOT, if we don't observe your federal speed limit, go take them and shove them. Right. Now, I think they pulled that off. I don't know. And that's all well and good. But the uh-huh. things that people are forgetting about is, where is your Social Security coming from? Where right. is your unemployment insurance coming from? Uh, where is the money for education coming from? You're going to be able to handle all this? And if you're in New Hampshire, let's say, which is the state that always makes, or at least people there, make all this noise about seceding, it's like, so what do you do now? You've got a truck, and you want to uh, get involved with interstate commerce. Right. All right, what do you do the minute you cross the White River? Uh, yep, that's right. Because, <clears throat> okay, South Carolina um, has gone out of uh, and, and told the government to shove it in certain of their motor vehicle laws because... Um, uh, they don't have inspections at all. Same in Florida. And, yeah. and um, they did, but then they went out and said that, um, uh, well, screw you, we're not going to go with the uh, pollution controls and yada, yada, yada. And they just flat out refused, and, and they didn't do it. And uh, they're not complaining about not having money. All right, so, but, so, so South Carolina also thumb their nose and can live without whatever's being yeah. withheld from them. Right, in that particular area. Now, in um, Article 1 of the state of North Carolina, <clears throat> it says, uh, the people, in, in Section 3, says internal government of the state, the people of this state shall have the inherent and sole and exclusive right of regulating the internal government and police thereof, and of altering or abolishing their constitution and form of government whenever it may be necessary for their safety and happiness. But every such right shall be exercised in pursuance of law consistently with the Constitution of the United States. Well, that sounds pretty good, right? Right. Section 4, secession prohibited. This state shall ever remain a member of the American Union. The people thereof are part of the American nation. Didn't say United States, did it? Right. There is no right on the part of this state to secede and all attempts from whatever source or upon whatever pretext to dissolve this union or to sever this nation shall be resisted with the whole power of the state. Now that's Article 3 and Article 4 right together. So one is saying that they can throw off their constitution, and they can throw off their government, and then the next section it says they can't. They can't leave the United States Corporation. Yeah, I wonder, too, I haven't looked at the Florida State Constitution in some time, and there's been a certain a number of them as well, and whether or not that, that clause is, is very emphatic in those states that did secede. Uh-huh. Um, I have to take a look now. And, and I, I also... I'm not, I mean, maybe you know this, and it's, this really is a, a digression, but I'm not, I don't even know if they ever rescinded the uh, um, Reconstruction Acts. No, they didn't. And, uh, you know, and if you think about that period in history, I mean, it's one thing, you let them back in the Union, uh-huh. and then because they're afraid they're not going to ratify the 13th or at least the 14th Amendment, you put them under martial law again. I mean, it's nuts. So, you know, anyway, that's, yeah. and so it goes. <laughs> The only oh people- yeah, they they uh, you know they they got it down. Now North Carolina is not one of those twenty states, and uh, I'm I'm pretty sure that this is why they're not going for that because it's written right in their constitution they can't do it. Well, another thing that's going around too, and this will be the third and the last thing, and that is uh, especially Tom DeWeese from the American Policy Center, I think, is going around making himself look like a hero uh, because supposedly he and um, the people who are, are involved or who support the American Policy Center are responsible or in the process of being responsible to uh, prevent a constitutional convention uh, to be called. Right. And i got to go check to see whether or not this is happening in states. Florida was never one of them mentioned, and I cannot find a list of all the ones that are supposedly in that situation. There's something like 27 or 32, depending on what story you read. And it only lists less than that. I asked him for a complete list. He didn't give it to me. Um, right. I got a problem with him in a lot of cases, although we've never spoken, except he was on the show years ago about property rights, did a good job. But uh-huh. I, I've been watching him lately, though, and uh, to me, he's claiming victories for stuff that isn't even happening. Now, having said oh, that, yeah. can you tell me anything about any kind of mumblings in state houses about wanting to call a new constitutional convention? Not here in North Carolina. 
There's none in uh, Florida either, but supposedly... None in South Carolina, because I know people in South Carolina. But the thing is, I remember this in the 70s. Whenever enough, I guess, people got PO'd... Oh, yeah. You would hear the talk about a constitutional convention. It never happens. No. Nope. And it's well, not Well, the same thing happened in about 1986, um, <clears throat> when I lived in another state in the Northeast, and uh, there was a big hullabaloo about having a constitutional convention then, too, and that was about 1986. I don't know if it was nationally known, but it was all around the Northeast, you know, uh, Virginia up to Maine. Yeah. And Pennsylvania. Didn't go into Ohio, but in all the Northeast region, all those particular Mid Atlantic states and Northeast states. And also, first of all, they're never going to let that contract be broken. I oh, would no. Think, no. Because it does tie in the old world uh, and not just what takes place in the United States. And secondly, right. people don't get the fact that even if they created something else, it would still not have any bearing on them. It would not help them out in the least. No. You know, which is one of the reasons why you know, I guess I'm getting more and more unpopular because people want to believe that somehow, some way, this whole monolith can be stopped, known as the uh, federal government. Right. And it's too late. And, and what are you going to do? I mean... And the other thing is also, people wonder why they can't exercise, and we've been over this ad nauseum, their constitutional rights in a federal court. It's because, obviously, you have none. Right. There is no constitutional right. rights. Uh, just like Judge Bork said when he was up for nomination, he says, give me one item of a right that the Constitution gave because I can't find any. That was what he said. Well, what then somebody going? would throw back, and well, what about the Bill of Rights? Yeah, yeah. But the Bill of Rights was, is not in the main body of the Constitution. And it has its own preamble, and it's totally separate. And it was only put there to satisfy the people at that time that were claiming that they wouldn't sign this, because North Carolina didn't sign that Constitution until well after 1787, because there was no Bill of Rights, and they wanted a Bill of Rights. So but, they, uh, you know, it, 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 it's... it's <laughs> It's meaningless. It has no bearing on the, the main body of the Constitution, uh, the way it was written. All right, now we're going to get into uh, the latest book that you have out, The Constitution for the United States, The Myth and the Reality. Right. Just who owns now, the United let me, States. Let me go into one thing in North Carolina. Oh, yeah, sure. And this is in Article um, 14, which is miscellaneous. And, of course, it gives a seat of government and general laws and continuity of laws and all that, but it says, <clears throat> and we found this uh, rather incredulous, and nobody in Raleigh in the uh, Judiciary Department could even explain it And when we showed it to them. State boundaries. The limits and boundaries of this state shall be and remain as they are now. That's it. And when we showed this and took this Constitution down to North Carolina, to, to Raleigh, the uh, lawyer in the um, attorney general's office couldn't believe it. He he uh, at first laughed, and he says, "That's ridiculous. Let me see that." <laughs> so we gave it to him, and and he says, "Huh? Well, we know why, um, because there was no boundaries <clears throat> that was set up because they're operating under the Virginia Company." Well, didn't you didn't you tell me that? those boundaries in effect, and let's just use North Carolina. Right. Don't they extend due west, like to the Mississippi? All the way to the Mississippi, that's right. In other words, what is Tennessee now was North Carolina. What is South Carolina just now went all the way over and took out part of Alabama and everything and went all the way over to the Mississippi. Now, that, that doesn't... Okay. Is there any vestige of that that makes any difference now, or... Is that something um, that just has been over, you know, kind of run over? Yeah, they they um, they got Tennessee and they broke it all up, and now of course they got all the boundaries that are listed there. But in the original and in the in the this latest Constitution, which is um, let me see, I just put it back. I'm trying to. This is uh, 1989. Uh, the Constitution of North Carolina: History and Content as of 1989 issued by Rufus Edmondson, Secretary of State of uh, North Carolina. 
And so up to 1989, it's still there, and they haven't changed it, and we, because they haven't changed the Constitution since then. So it's still there. Well, would that also mean that if you carve out Tennessee, let's say, for North Carolina, whatever was uh, brought to bear upon North Carolina, by extension, is brought to bear upon Tennessee? Yeah. Now, remember, in the Constitution, didn't it say that they could never take a state and break it up and make another one? Hey, that's what they did. Tennessee was North Carolina. They broke all of North Carolina right in half and right at the uh, uh, border over there now in the, in, the, uh, in the Great Smokies. That was the dividing line, and that goes against what the Constitution of the United States said. Well, well they carved out West Virginia from Virginia as well, isn't that right? Sure, yeah. <laughs> and I don't know, this may have been grandfather, I kind of think it is, but tell me. I mean, also, they carved Massachusetts out of Maine. Right. Was that pre-constitutional, though? I guess it was. Yeah, that was, that okay. was yeah. <laughs> yeah, because that was called the Massachusetts Bay Note, and uh, there was uh, big discrepancies up there at that time, and that's where they broke off into Rhode Island and Massachusetts, Connecticut, you know. <laughs> there was all one landmass there uh, called Massachusetts. Right. And then, of course, they broke up that, but that was before. Okay. Uh, one, one thing, just uh, uh, kind of tongue-in-cheek, but it's true. Uh, there was not one, not two, not three, but by all accounts from historians down in Florida, there were probably seven wars between the Seminoles and the federal government. Uh -huh. What's interesting is the Seminoles never signed a, a peace treaty. Okay. E effectively, they're still at war with the government. But right. what I had to laugh at is that um, our uh, Secretary of State, uh, McCullum, I think it is, I forget, is starting right. to lean on the Indian gaming um, operations. And oh, I'm, that's what they're doing here in North Carolina. But I'm, but I'm looking at this going, you've got no jurisdiction. <laughs> right. Am I right or wrong? I mean, this is, this is federal. That, yep, that because... Um, and um, they're making a big stink about the Cherokees over there and their gaming and their um, video poker and everything. But that's on Indian territory. Yeah. You know, and they're trying to horn in on that now. It's been on TV up here quite a okay. bit. Okay. And, you know, the disgrace wasn't as bad as it has been since, Lord, since, since the first Europeans came here. It's interesting is that whenever you, whenever the appeasement was to give the native peoples, you know, like for instance, they gave them the rock piles out in South Dakota. Yeah. But that was okay until they found uranium underneath it. Uh -huh. And then they wanted their butts off that too. Same yep. thing here in Florida, North Carolina, whatever. They've got a good thing going. They're running it very well. And now the, mm -hmm. now the state's pissed off about it because it's a, a success and they can't leave that alone. Right. So right. go Seminoles. <laughs> Yep. <laughs> I don't mean Florida State, but anyway. Uh, okay, uh, now why the new book? Why uh, the Constitution for the United States, the myth and the reality? What's in here that we haven't seen before? Okay, um, this started back when Obama was running and everybody was arguing that he couldn't be president and so on and so forth. And um, I kept seeing it on the Internet, and I says, ah, uh, uh, these people are crazy, you know. Uh, there's so many untruths and everything that are out there. I'm going to go and I'm going to research this and, and see just why they're saying Obama can't be a president. <clears throat> and that's what started the book. That's as simple as that. And it ended up going into how we are controlled, where we were controlled by who, and the the fact that the the first nine presidents could not pass the constitutional requirements to be a president. All right, and so uh, that's what basically started the whole book. And uh, a lot of stuff I can get it, and people can get it on um, the internet. And in the historical fact. Well, a lot of people would say, oh, well, 1776, that's when we created the United States. No, it couldn't be. It had to be after a treaty. And in the CIA.gov website, it states, and it's a historical fact, right from the U.S. government, sometimes they do tell the truth. The United States never existed before the year 1783. 
quote, Britain's American colonies broke with the mother country in 1776 and were recognized as a new nation of United States of America following the Treaty of Paris in 1783. So forget about creating in 1776 and having a nation called the United States of America uh, America is the nation, but the United States was the uh, corporation that came into being in 1783. And the Constitution was adopted in 1787, only by those few that drafted it. It was never put to the people to ratify it, and it goes. the book goes into that, and, and how, uh, because the Pope dictated the terms of the treaty, and uh, the front man at the time was the king. <clears throat> Remember, the Pope's got to sit way in the background, way, way in the background. He's mafia. <clears throat> uh, we're talking about the black Pope now, because there always was a white Pope who called himself the vicar, which is another big lie, of, of uh, Christ. And um, the tenets of the Catholic Church and the Vatican that he now controls and did control... One of the tenets was that no man in the entire world could ever own possessions of real estate. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, this book goes into explaining that and why, and uh, from all the documents of government that I went in and got everything in there, uh, just proves... <clears throat> Uh, such as the particular one here from the government's history of presidents document. You can find it on the Internet, and I, I even state that in the book. And it says, John Adams, 1735-1826, born in Quincy, Massachusetts, was the second president of the United States. He was president from 1797 to 1801. And then I underlined it in the book, but was born a British subject. Right. Wait a minute. The Constitution. What they're talking about Obama, right? And because he wasn't uh, a United States citizen. Well, right here from the government's own document, all the way down to um, William Henry Harrison, was born a British subject, which is true, because remember, Britain owned all this Virginia Land Company in 1600. And, and before. And if all these presidents were born, <clears throat> like Washington, 1732, Adams, 1735, Jefferson, 1743, they're still on British soil. They were born as British subjects. Their mother and father was British subjects. James Madison, 1751, Monroe, uh, 1758, Tyler, 1790. Okay. 1783 is when the United States was officially and internationally recognized as a nation. 1783. Here, Tyler was born 1790. So they make no mention of him being a British subject. All right, his mother and father were British subjects, but he was born on U.S. soil. The way that the Constitution was set up, a Mexican crossing into um, California who was pregnant to, you know, get the medical benefits and all this, they have a child born in California, say San Diego. He is automatically a U.S. citizen, even though the mother and father are Mexican subjects. Right. Now, um, so that's why John Tyler and Zachary Taylor um, was also... Uh, no mention of being a British subject. And even when it goes back to Martin Van Buren, do you know that he was the first natural-born, they say, he was the first natural-born U.S. citizen to become president? This is from the bibliographies of the presidents on, that you can find on the Internet. Right. He was born in 1782. And he was born in New York State. Yeah, well, he was born in Columbia, New York. Right. And... He was also, did not speak English as a first language, having grown up speaking Dutch. Of Dutch descent, he was born 
December 2nd, December 5th, 1782, in Kinderhook, New York. Yeah. I was so gonna... right there, you know, it was 1783 was a year later is when the United States was created. So no way he can be a natural-born U.S. citizen. It's an impossibility. All right, cause he because was... the United States wasn't created until a year later. <laughs> All right, so, so he was born in what was a colony at the time and not the state of New York. Right. Yeah. In fact, I, I used to pass by his birthplace all the time. I never stopped in because it's right along uh, U.S. Uh, 9 that right. goes up the east side of the uh, Hudson and goes through Tinderhook in Columbia County. Right. Now, uh, in, in the book, uh, I'm only up to like page 16, but in the book it says, um, I explain how that when the king wrote the treaty, he put in there the most holy undivided trinity. And he was also called the arch treasurer of the United States. He still was. Now, we're back up into 1213 where the king gave all his property and subjects to the pope to be recommunicated so his soul wouldn't go to his soul could go to heaven. And all the British subjects, their souls then could go to heaven. Okay. Now, at that point, the Vatican owned the entire British Empire and all of its subjects. All the king's subjects were turned over to him, carte blanche. Uh, now, when they created the 1787 Constitution, it wasn't by the framers. That's one big myth. That's why the book is called The Myth and the Reality. What happened was, um, and this is in uh, major documents of the United States that anybody can find on the Internet. I gave a lot of sites in the book. Otherwise, this book would be humongous and people couldn't afford it. But I, I, I took, like, uh, where they can find it, British Museum Production, um, GRC Davis, entitled Magna Carta, and American Council of Christian Laymen, and, and I give also other sites where they would have to go to the library to get it. They couldn't get it on the Internet. It's, it, it's not there. But I do give um, email sites where they can go and pick up a lot of this uh, to show to them themselves what uh, you're looking for. Like uh, some of the sources I got was treaties and other international acts of the United States of America and from the government printing office in 1931 and other ones like uh, the library, uh, BYU educational and, and the rest of it out to the European documents. And they can go on this while they're reading a book and go to their computer, sit there, type in the site, and boom, they got exactly what is in the book, only more detail. Uh, they, uh, the framers, when the Pope found out that the king was trying to get rid of his properties over here, and... Uh, the Bank of England was involved in this, too. There's three people who was involved in, in this deal. The Bank of England, the Pope, and um, uh, the King. All right? They were all had their hands in this pie over here. So what happened was they formed a cabal, and what they did was present it to the um, people uh, okay they, they uh, uh, hold on just a second <coughs> um, my son just come in uh, and he just wrote something for me and walked out and <laughs> okay. he just had his uh, traffic case dismissed uh, they tried to get him for uh, running a stop sign I mean this is, this is I'm just letting you know what happened okay. and um <laughs> Two tries, and the, the cop never showed up. This time the cop showed up. He just walked in and wrote it down. The case was dismissed because uh, he had all the documents. He even took his video camera out, and I looked at it, and he took it down to the court, and this is what caused him to win his case. But 
Well, right, well did he fact, run the stop sign or didn't he? <laughs> no, no, he didn't. Uh, the way that the cop was set up was that he was looking for speeders. Right. And he just happened to be parked about 100 yards down the road, and there was an embankment where a T comes. And my son came down, and he has a little geo. And um, when the picture was, when I looked at it, there was a truck in front of him pulling a trailer. So he pulled up, and there was a stop sign. And the law says that you cannot go past the stop sign. You have to stop anywhere at that stop sign, and you can stop two miles back if you want. It, there's nothing in the statute that, that says um, where you got to stop unless there's a mark, a white line marked out. Then you can go up to the white line even if the uh, white line is past the stop sign <clears throat> by 10, 20 feet. Okay. Well, when the truck pulled up, you could see my son's top of his car. That's all he could see, just the top. And he, and he parked right behind the truck. The truck took off and left. He inched up to the stop sign. You couldn't see the car. It's impossible to see the car. It's so small. <clears throat> so he stopped. Then he took off, and he come around and into view, and the cop, at that time he's moving like 10 miles an hour, maybe 20 miles an hour. The cop gave him a ticket for running a stop sign because the cop couldn't see him. He was the only car that came up. And uh, that's what happened. And um, so he recorded all that on his camera from both angles and uh, took it down to the court. He got he left here about 9 o'clock. And he just walked in and, and okay. wrote on here, dismissed. Well, you know, I've, I've often <laughs> wondered. Any, I didn't get any details on him because we're on the, on the air. But uh, right. he, he knew I was talking, so he just wrote on the well, piece of paper. All right, hang on to your thought for a second. But I will tell you that there are times I've wondered. I've been behind a car that stopped for traffic at a T. You know, we're waiting for traffic to, to subside from the left and the right. Right. But I'm already stopped. Oh, yeah. And I can yeah. see what the car in front of me sees. So that car goes off, and I go off. And I'm like, oh, you know, what is the deal? I mean, I, I was stopped. I saw that there was nothing coming. Or, or, you know, and then you wonder if you have to come up and do your own little stop thing because you're first in line. You know what I mean? Yeah. Okay. yeah. Uh, no, that's not true in North Carolina and in New Jersey. Uh, well, nobody uh, stops in New Jersey. No, I know that. <laughs> <laughs> they just whip on through. Yeah, you got a problem but with that? <laughs> once the train goes through, it starts <laughs> the it. engine goes through, it pulls all the cars with it. <laughs> But, uh, no, if in North Carolina you're the third car, then you have to stop. Okay. You do your own stop. But right. if you're the second car, the next car, the immediate car behind it, you're well within that 20 feet of the stop sign. All okay. right. I, I, don't, I, I hope you remember where we're going, but before you do or don't, I just want to say one thing, too. In that Treaty of Paris of 1783, which was drafted by King George III, he also names himself the elector of the Holy Roman Empire, I'm assuming that means it's the Pope's man in Britain. Yes. Okay. He's the front man. Right. That's why they say the Holy Undivided Trinity. And a lot of people will say, the Trinity, that's three. Now, who is the three people? A lot of people would say, oh, well, it was the framers, you know, John Jay that they sent over there and Adams and all that. And the king and 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 who is the third treaty? Who is the third? The Trinity? The third well, party, yeah. Nobody knows. Well, the third party happens to be the Pope, because yep. the Pope owns this property of the king. <clears throat> and the king being in his front man, he ain't about to let his property go. So what they did was they adopted it. And it was confederacies up to that point. But uh, right in the Constitution, uh, in the documents that I got from the government, it says that the Constitution was adopted by the framers. Well, wait a minute. People don't understand what adopted means. I'm going to tell you what it means. From the 1828 dictionary, adopt, verb, uh, one, legally take another's child in brackets and bring it up as one's own. Two, choose to take or follow an option of course or action. Three, British, choose as a candidate of office for assume an attitude or position. To take or receive as one's own, which is not naturally so. And then they give the derivatives <clears throat> and adopted. Take as one's own, selected for use. 
So what it was, they adopted the Constitution. They didn't write it themselves. It was written by the cabal and presented to them. And that's how the Constitution was formed and why the people had no say whatsoever as to the Constitution. And now, when you go back and you read the 1788 Virginia debates where Patrick Henry said, um, who, all right, and Patrick Henry, in the debates, I'll read the quote, and with you don't know the foundation, you won't know what he's talking about, and you're left in limbo assuming what is not true. And here is what it is. But, sir, give me leave to demand what right had they to say, we the people. Now, who were they that Patrick was talking about? The crown pope or the framers? The framers. Uh, uh, that's what everybody would believe. Right. But it is the crown pope. I put crowns because it's plural, <clears throat> because the crown was the Bank of England, and the crown could also be called the king. So it was the Bank of England, the king, and the pope that he was talking about. And there was what right did they have to say, we the people? And then he says, if the states be not agents of this compact, which means a contract, it must be one great consolidated national government of the people of all the states, which couldn't be because the people never signed anything. Until it, right. There was no, nothing whatsoever in any of the state constitutions of the original colonies that was given to the people to ratify it. Nothing <clears throat> well, at all. Now, apparently the Founding Fathers were sent, as the story goes, by the elected representatives uh, of the 13 uh, newly created states. Uh, right. it, it, is that true? I mean, are we who, who did that then? I mean, did they have their own state Congress people and a senator? Yeah, what it was, okay, the, the, the states formed first as confederacies. Everybody would, would agree to that. <clears throat> now, what they did <clears throat> is those elite people who did own the states, the corporations of the crown, the king at that time, Virginia, remember, it broke off. See, this book goes into much more detail than what I, we could hear on the radio show, right. and, and it walks you through a process when you get to the end of the book that you'll understand how this all came about. But just to come up and hit a man on the street, like we're hitting the people today on the radio show, and start into discussion of oh, the king owns this, and the king owns that, and so on and so forth, and, and the pope owns all of them, they won't understand. In the very back of the book, I'm going to read the one page, and this is the last inside page cover. The power structures of those that not only control America but the world are what I refer to as the big three are as follows. The pope controls all attorneys. They're the Knights Templars. It goes into detail. Therefore, all courts are ecclesiastical courts. Not what people think. So established with the intent that they will protect the Big Three's RICO establishment. The Pope controls all the banking in the world. The Crown Bank controls the gold, silver, and all minerals. These are the people who set the prices of gold, silver, as well as oil on a daily basis basis in what is referred to as the London market. This alone should tell you where the control of the world rests all the paper money that it was set up to control the people. They gave authority to operate a RICO establishment. The Pope controls the Crown Bank, and he does. He never did before. He had his own bank. The King. As King in Council to this day, the city controls Congress and the legislatures of the United States and the states as they are mere agents by appointment through the governor of the Bank of England, the principal by contract to the charter of the Virginia Company, in so much that the big three are not written into any statute, so they can be sued without their consent. See page case 72 at the top. 
there is right there from the own government's documents it says they will not be <coughs> cited to be sued in any statute that is written by Congress or the state legislatures. The big three dictate to their agents, Congress, their executive, and their private contract. Courts to exact anything they wanted and control the common man by posing as a government when they are merely appointed agent fronts for the big three's racketeering, <coughs> corrupt, influenced organization. This way, the people would never know they are controlled by the same company established by the king, but now under the control of the city, the city of London, separate from England, to this day has controlled them from 1609 to the present day. They created the name United States under the one company, the Virginia Company, rather than continue to be known as the British Empire. The United States became their corporate division, like Chevrolet is a division of General Motors. The three branches of the Chevy division are Suburban, Sprint, and Impala. The three branches of the U.S. are Congress, Executive, and the Courts. The states are mere satellites as they are the dealers of General Motors, selling all General Motors cars. So they have a neat package deal that protects those in the three branches from prosecution, unless they get so far out of hand, the general populace gets so incensed that they have to save the status quo, they jail a few. If those in the states or branches go against the big three, then they too will be dealt with, but with the main goal is to subjugate the people to better control them. Hey, this explains why the states can't secede from the corporation that we were talking about at the top of the show. Right. <clears throat> this pretend government saw that they can also get in on the scam and lop off a piece of our pie for themselves. But remember, the white and black Pope Vatican runs everything and controls all of the above. The criminal Pope controls you. And uh, I got an email today, this morning, before I called you, and it was from a big uh, meeting they had down here in Charlotte, North Carolina, and they used the Hayfield Research comes to the Carolinas. <clears throat> and in the research, they have a whole bunch of organizations in here. And it says, uh, capitalism, however, has been a fundamental structural flaw, overproduction, underconsumption, in Hayfield's language, the law of cap, the flaw of capitalism. And then they go in about the conspiracy theories and so on and so forth. And in here it says that Hayfield argues we need a new American revolution. To expose his purpose is to expose the Fabians, both past and present, and finally free ourselves from dominance of the crown. So they're partially right, but they don't know how far off they are. And he says, um, to what extent is Mr. Hayfield right? I will say that he sent me several notebooks of research drawing my attention to facts such as the Fabian role of the roundtable groups, the Bilderbergers, uh, the trilateralists, and see what they're doing here. And, and Rockefeller Sr. and uh, John Maynard Keyes and Edward Mando, Mandel House and John Dewey, and it goes through a lot of people and a lot of corporations and everything, but it never gets to the meat of, okay, if we're controlled by all these corporations and everything, like he says. Why? Well, I'm going to give your readers a view here. You can't copy this. It's non-copyable. <clears throat> but you can get it on the Internet, and I do have this site. I think I put it in the book. If not, I am getting so many questions right now that I am going to make answers and uh, answers to the questions and put them on ATG Press like Montgomery did when he wrote his um, We're Still Under British Control. Right. And so anybody after the book gets pretty well out and I field all the questions and I'll put them into a package and then I will post the answers to the questions on the book after I, you know, so many people, if you put out 50 or 100 books and you get 50 or 100 questions, and a lot of them will be duplicates. So right. I'm going to go through a series of uh, a few months 
and get all these questions and throw the duplicates all together and answer it. And that's how they'll find a lot of this stuff. But when I tried to copy this, and, and I could sit down and write it out, but it's real time consuming. Now, I'm going to give you the organizational structure based on the Vatican, and it comes right from the Vatican. <laughs> um, the top of the structure, these are all blocks, and, they, and they, you know how the blocks come down and they spread out. Yeah, it's like a flow okay. chart, yeah. Or, or, yeah. Uh -huh. It's a flow chart, yeah. And it's a block diagram of the organizational structure. And the people just wants to put it at the top of the block. Here's the top of the block. Satan slash Lucifer. Draw a line down to the next block. Superior General of the Jesuits. Here they have Peter Hans calling back. He was retired. It is now Adolfo Nicolas. Right, the Spaniard, yep. Under from that, the Jesuit order. He rules the Jesuit order. Under the Jesuit order are this block that he rules. Council of 13 of Bavarian Illuminati. Council of 33 degree Masons of the Scottish Rite. The 13 Satanic Bloodlines. The Committee of 300. Bernay Bernith, the Grand Orient. Drop down, and underneath of there, in the next group, there is <clears throat> two groups, money and banking group, okay? And um, on the next one, let me see if I can bring this over here, is the secret society group, Okay. Let's see who the black pope in the Vatican controls in this group. I just messed it up here. I got to bring it back. It's real tricky when you when you operate this. Uh, yeah, you have it in a, a photo editor, right? Yeah, and uh, yeah, and if you use the uh, the mouse. <laughs> yeah, and, and the and the block that they put here covers part of that. And, and all right. So in the money group, here is who the Vatican controls today. The Federal Reserve, USA, European Central Bank, BCE, International Monetary Fund, World Bank, World Trade Organization, Natural Central Banks, International Bank of Settlements, World Conservation Bank, Multinational Corporations, Exxon, Disney, Shell, Bayer, and Hollywood. <laughs> Sounds interesting, doesn't it? Yeah. Okay, uh, the foundation of Rockefeller, the Nobel Foundation, the International, International Banking Rothschild, Chase Manhattan Bank, Deutsche Bank, Bank of England, Goldman and Sachs. That is who the Vatican controls today. Now, let's go over to the Secret Society Group. And this, you'll probably know some of these from this email that I got. Freemasons, Scottish and York Rites, Skull and Bones, Grand Orient Lodge, Grand Alphenia Lodge, Knights Templar, Royal Order of the Garter, Priori de Sion, Rocusherans, the Thule Society, Knights of Malta, Knights of Columbus, and the P2 Lodge. Now, we come down from the um, Illuminati, they, the line goes to those two groups, and straight down from the Illuminati, there are more groups that the black pope controls in this country today, and here they are. Education group, mm. UNESCO, World Peace Groups, Planetary Congress, World Federalist Association, World Constitution and Parliamentary Association, environmental groups, all of them, WWF, Greenpeace, interesting, Lucifer Trust, it's called Lucas Trust. Yeah, the old Lucius Trust, yeah. Yeah. We're a good World Goodwill, World Union, Eastland Institute, all media establishments, American Society for... Biology. Oh, wait a minute. Let me get. Okay. 
American Society for Microbiology. Now let's go over to the intelligence group. The Pope owns and controls exclusively these groups, as many of them he set up himself. CIA, FBI, NSA, Program Echelon, USA, KGB, Mossad, Israel, BND, Germany, DS, DGSE, France, the British Intelligence, SIS, the Communist Party, Interpol and Europol, drug cartels, FEMA, they put Shadow Government USA, Secret Services of Pakistan, drug cartels, and organized crime. <coughs> That's what he controls today. People don't understand. Religious groups. Well, the Pope is not a religion. He's out to destroy, in the Vatican, out to destroy the words of the Lord so that he is not even recognized by anybody today. And this is the push to get in God we trust and prayer out of the schools and all this crap. Here's a religious group that the Vatican controls. World Council of Churches. That means everyone. Yep. National Council of Churches. World Parliament of Religions. New Age Movements. Unity Church. Unitarian Universalist Church. Baha, Temple of Understanding, oh, the Baha'i. Vatican, yeah. the Pope and the Cardinal, Cardinals of the Vatican, Opus Dei, D-I, D-E-I, Roman Catholic Church, al Qaeda, Bin Laden, Theophysical Society, Nation of Islam in the USA, Hamas and Hezbollah. Interesting, huh? Yeah. Here's... Well, here is the political groups that they control. National government leaders, the United Nations, Bilderberger, Trilateral Commission, and I got pictures of the Black Pope with the entire Trilateral Commission all assembled together in one room. Council of Foreign Relations, Aspen Institute, Club of Rome, Bohemian Grove, European Union, NATO, Pilgrim Society, Fabian Society, Roundtable, Royal Institute of International Affairs, European Royal Families, England, Spain, Netherlands, and Taiwan, Institute Francos des Relations Internationals. Now, you want to know who runs this country? The book tells everything. Well, it doesn't have this in there because it's too big and I can't copy it and it would take a long time to write it down in block form and then condense it and put it in something that people could read. All right, so where did this come from? This comes right from the Vatican. It's on the source. Let me see. It is... Uh, <clears throat> if people want to get it, I'll give them the website. www.biblio. Oh, yeah. T E. C A P L E Y A D E S dot net and forward slash zoom Z O O M I F Y E R forward slash E S P underscore or underline it's not a, a hyphen Jesuits Dot All right, what I'll do is I'll put those links up with the audio, too, so they can click on that as well. Yeah. Because I have them. You sent them to me a while ago. Oh, okay, yeah. Yeah. And um, there's a lot of one here, and I also got the uh, bookmark for uh, the, uh, the Vatican Mortgage Part 1, and I found the Vatican Mortgage Part 2 of how they control all the mortgages in this country today and how they did it well and uh and also um that is let me see the website on that is www dot w i l l t h o m a s o n l i n e dot net uh, it, 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 if you 
get that, it should go over because it's got forward slash and it, and it repeats the same thing again. Uh, so that's right there. And also, uh, I got the book from the Jesuit, uh, who was a Jesuit member, uh, Edmund Paris. Right, the Secret Treaty. Yep. I mean, the Secret History, rather, excuse me. Secret History, right. 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 Yeah, and I have that PDF, too, if anybody wants it. If you want to go looking for it, you can. If you want me to send it to you, I'll do that. Well, what it is now, <coughs> excuse me, I went and I looked at uh, Nicholas uh, Adolfo, and, uh, or Adolfo Nicholas. He's the new black pope. He actually had the, uh, the, the pope kicked out. <coughs> he was told to retire early. And as of January the 1st, Nicholas... Uh, Adolfo Nicholas is the new pope in 2009. Now, what is interesting is they relate to the pope as controlling the Pentagon, the U.S. Pentagon, but what he really is doing is he has a front man doing it for him who is Admiral Mullins, who is the chief of staff of the Pentagon. Now, people would say, Oh, you know, I must be crazy and all this. Hey, it's right there on the Internet. You can go and pull it up. You know, it's nothing that you can't find, but nobody looks. They put everything out in plain sight, but they don't uh, come in to... uh, This is where my research skills came in, because when I told another well-known researcher, I said, you can't find this in a statute. You ain't going to find this written jump up and say, oh, look, this is what I did to all you people, you know. They are not that crazy that they're going to give this information to anybody that just wants to look for it. Uh, Like, if you're going to keep a secret, you ain't going to write something down for someone to find that secret, are you? Well, I mean, you know, that's, that's common sense. Look, you know, we've talked about this before, and still the idea of that kind of structure to most Americans, and I mean Americans, right, uh, is laughable. And I understand, you know, for all the reasons why they felt that way. But when I first came upon this and I started to check it out, I mean, you go to more sources, and in this case, back in time, uh, and you realize, and we've always said this, that Europeans are very much more aware of the instigations and the provocateuring of the Vatican, you know, before, during, and after the yeah. Jesuits took him over because there was a bit of a spat there going on for a while, and then finally the Jesuits did take control of the Vatican. But no matter what, I mean, the papacy has always been despotic, regardless who's been there. That's right. And it's it's gone on this long. I mean, it's 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 a massive part of history that is very much covered up in the United States. And, and I sent you along something that Charles Wilcox, who wrote The Transformation of the Republic, sent me. And uh-huh. those were JPEGs, images of... Uh, a newspaper back in what 1891 called the Patriotic American, which posted uh, Pope, uh, Pope Leo the Thirteenth's encyclical, the Bull. And right. what does it say in there? Is that they declare everything on this earth the property of the Vicar of Christ, and that is the Pope. Yeah, that's right. And they think they're kidding. Now, you know, whatever happened to that 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 document, uh, that newspaper? And again, you know, he showed other things too. The whole idea about. The Vatican being told by the U.S. government, if you don't give up John uh, Sirhan, uh, I'm sorry, Surratt, mm-hmm. who was involved in, in the Lincoln conspiracy, we're going to break off diplomatic relations with you. Right. And that was posted in New York dailies at the time. Nobody yeah. remembers it. You don't see a thing about it. Uh-huh. And you know, nobody wants to go back. Huh? Yeah, nobody wants to go back in time. And most patriots can't see, you know, the end of their nose or the end of their fingers, what they can touch. They don't look for something, and no, nobody plans in America 200 years down the road. It, it, it's, you know, they're self-serving. They, you know, can only see as far as they're going to live, maybe. Yeah, and that's it. And, you know, again, I've beaten this to death, but that's that's what happened. I mean, I, I followed it. I had heard Phelps originally, and I thought he was crazy. And then I checked it out, and I went to other books and other people. And then you mm-hmm. go back in time, and you realize that people give it first-hand accounts all through the right. 19th century. Oh, yeah. You know, watch out now, for this. Right. When I had, um, I had about three people helping me on this book, and one of the researchers, 
I put it in Chapter 7, and I put other researchers finding an involvement. In conversation with another man that does research, he said to what I found. And here's his quote, and I put it right in here from his email. Now I see Esquire means a Knight Templar even today. The fact that a lawyer's first responsibility is to the court makes perfect sense. His allegiance is to the Vatican through the king in council, and this is why we are considered the children of the court, of course. The Pope declares us to be his children. The Pope is the father, and the church the mother. They are telling us it's an ecclesiastical court. So the United States of America, as plaintiff in Congress, and I'm going to leave out his mistake. Okay. Um, <clears throat> All right. Um, the United States of America as plaintiff in Congress, King and Council, Bank of England, Vatican, the ecclesiastical court presented, represented by the King's Bench. Now the King's Bench has to be an ecclesiastical court by the Treaty of 1213. As stated, the King takes a special interest in the King's Bench. Of course, he has to by his treaty obligation to the Pope. There is not an agency in bankruptcy. Is there not an agency in bankruptcy in every courtroom in a tax case? One for each state. I forgot the details of this. Well, his details was what I had sent him before. There are 60 trustees of the United States that are cognizant of every tax case in America. If this is correct, the Pope's agent is in the courtroom. Yeah, he is. This makes the case legit, but we don't know it. Everybody there in the king's bench is running the show for his boss, the Pope, and the Pope is in the crown's court room, and anyone who has an attorney has hired an agent of the court. In other words, what, what he says here is what I found and told him that all attorneys in the world, which is not listed in this organizational structure, all the attorneys in the world and courts, are owned and created by the black pope in the Vatican because they chartered the ABA, not as an ABA, but they chartered the Bar Association, which was created in 1355. Every Everyone in court, that's why the judges wear black robes representing the black pope. Yep. People don't understand this. They think, oh, the myth was we set up this Constitution. We wrote this. We ratified it. Yeah, they didn't ratify it. squat. Their signature can't even be uh, put on there. And when they go to read Lysander Spooner, he laid it right out in his Constitution of No Authority that the framers only witnessed it. If you read the Constitution at the back, it says they witnessed this document. You can't witness something unless it was presented to you by another party, party. and the other party was the Pope, King, and Bank that wrote the Constitution that they adopted, and that's why they only signed it as witnesses and not as a binding contract amongst themselves. Um, I just want to mention, because I haven't before, and that is uh, I'll have a link to order uh, this book, The Constitution for the United States, The Myth and the Reality, Just Who Owns the United States. Uh, I'm going to make it available through my PayPal just to make it more facilitous for you folks who don't want to go through the process you might have gone through before, which is the the, um, the po mo postal money order and then mailing it uh, to IMAN. So I mean, you can still do that. You can still go to atgpress.com and go through that same process, or you can go to uh, my website where you can, you're listening uh, to this audio from with the links that he's mentioned, and also it'll be a click on to say to order uh, the myth and the reality. We'll just keep it uh, short, and you can do it that way, and all funds go to uh, the IMAN. So that's we're going to do that to see if if it helps uh, stimulate, if you would, uh, some sales. Not because he's, they've done badly, just because it's. I know it's 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 a click, and a lot of people want to do that this way uh, nowadays. Also, uh, you know, IMAN when you and I first began, and, and we didn't do uh, we didn't talk much about the Vatican. In the first year or more, uh, I had come upon it another way. You came upon it as well. And but the last time, few times we've been together, we've talked more about it. The thing that is such a hard sell for folks, and obviously it's not our business to try to convince anybody, but for people to make themselves aware, 
and that is you've been told in Scripture what the conspiracy is about. Right. Like, like you just said, who sits on top of the, the hill? It's Satan. Now, people will believe in Satanists and Satanic cults, but they don't believe in Satan. Right. I would, and let me, let me just add this. In my take right now with what's going on, the Vatican and the Pope are storefronts. They're facades for Satan who works through the Jesuit general, the true black Pope. Right, and not only that, but every president in this country has been put there by the Vatican. Everyone, because you know the Vatican, how are they going, how is the black pope going to come over here and do everything that he's supposed to do to run his corporation? Well, he's got to have a front man, just like the mafia has, right? Sure. The front man is the president. Uh, In the book, it goes in and it shows you that every president in this country was an attorney. Every governor of North Carolina but two from the inception in 1776 has been an attorney. And that's why attorneys have to be the front man. And the president, most of them are attorneys. Even in the um, other organizational structure that I have, <coughs> on the, that I got from the Internet, uh, gives people that you would not believe that are controlled or accede to the control of the Pope. And Martin Sheen, there are many Hollywood people, <coughs> because as the organizational structure, it says Disneyland, Hollywood, Exxon, multinational corporations are controlled by the Pope. But they're controlled by the Pope. I mean, he doesn't come up and say, hey, here I am. Now you do this and you do that. You know, No, it's more subtle. It is who is controlling them. Uh, do you know that in the one article, the actual book that I have, and believe it or not, there are people in there like Pryor, um, Jesse Jackson, um, oh well-known dignitaries and movie stars. Well, Gibson and his old man are, uh, are heavy into that. Mel pardon? Gibson and his father, I forget what his name oh, is. Oh, Mel Gibson, name? yes, yes. And you know, you, whatever his name is, the old man. Right. Uh, uh, um, yeah, I was just trying to, um, there's so many that uh, it just boggles the mind. Well, what we shouldn't that, overlook, though, and that's what happened last week. I mean, I, I say this somewhat tongue-in-cheekly, but, I, it, but it's the truth, and that is, you got a new president last week. It wasn't, right. it wasn't Obama, it was Dolan. Dolan is now the archbishop in New York City, which is the number yes. one spot amongst all uh, uh, cardinals in the United States. So he came out of Milwaukee, he took uh-huh. Egan's place, and now he's the one that's running the show, because the CFR is a couple of blocks down the road, and Rockefeller right. is a couple of blocks down the road. Yep. Uh, it's not a coincidence. No, and uh, that's why, uh, and the Pope wants to kill somebody because one of the presidents decided he's going to go against them. Lincoln is an example. Uh, McKinley is another example. Kennedy is another example. Yeah, and, and they, failed, um, they failed to poison Buchanan, but they poisoned Taylor. Right. Cher- uh, cherries right. and milk with sour, okay. Uh-huh. And that's called the Borge poisoning, and Borge is the poison? second... Yeah, Borgia, I think that's what it is. Yeah, Yeah. and um, I forget whether he was the third or the fourth pope. And it was him that called the Borgia poisoning. And when the white popes would not follow the dictates of the Jesuit black pope, they were killed also. John Paul I. Yep. And you can look at that, and it's fiction based on fact in the movie Godfather Three. Uh-huh. And that's why uh, he controls, that's why they say in the organizational structure, they control the drug cartels and the mafia. Well, and also there's there's some photos, uh, I believe spirituallysmart.com has, has quite a few, where you see the Pope at some times, but the Cardinals in Europe at others, uh, giving the Sig Heil right along with Adolf and the boys. Yeah, and when they give the uh, goats um, salute. Yeah, the horns. Uh, yeah, the it's the, yeah. You, you, the last the the last pinky and the first finger are what is shown, and 
they even show the people, Bush doing it, yeah. and giving it, and another guy is standing there in another um, thing in Congress with his hand up on his lapel like he's going to uh, salute the flag, but he's got the goat finger sitting there right on his breast. Yeah, was, there was a photo in one of the uh, uh, British dailies uh -huh. that showed Bush and his wife, and I, I think it might have been Blair and his wife, and you can see that Bush has got the horns down by his side. I mean, it stares you right in the face. It was in a mainline newspaper. Right. And you wonder about it. You know, I mean, and, and I don't want to get into too much of other, other things, but I'm still wondering what in the world that, that handshake's about with the extended uh, index finger. Yeah. I got, you know, I got a photo of Bush and uh, the Cardinal at the time. I forget who that was. Okay. And I mean that's even that's not even a Masonic grip as far as I can tell, but something's going on where you where you see this all the time. Oh yeah, and um, who's that that guy? Oh, the Church of Scientology. Hubbard. Yeah, uh, Ron L. Hubbard. He was uh -huh. also under the Jesuits' control, and so is the guy that movie star with him and his wife. You talk about Travolta? Yeah, uh, no, it no. wasn't Travolta. Is the other guy? Um, oh, oh yeah, Tom. Uh, Tom Cruise. Yeah, <clears throat> yeah, he's under Jesuit control. Yeah, well, their headquarters are right across the bay from me here. <laughs> yep. <laughs> and uh, you know, the American people, never having been exposed to this, thinks we're crazy. Oh, you got to you know, yeah, you're nuts. Yeah. You know, you're. It, it, I, I think if I presented this to my brother, he would say I'm crazy. Yeah. Uh, there's and no that's doubt. My brother, you know. But you see, this is the point where you get to, it's like, do you want to know or don't you? And most people don't want to. So, but then the other thing is, you don't get a chance then, of course they do though, to berate right. it. Because yeah. you didn't want to take a look. Doesn't mean it's not true, but you get to go ahead then and say it's all false, but you never did anything. Well, before the book came out, there was some well-known patriots that um, I let have a little info. Two of them blacklisted me from their email. <laughs> yeah, oh, I they said I'm crazy. Uh, I have no proof. Uh, let's get back to the basics, which is statutes. And you know, they said, why don't I go back to the old way that I did everything and get to the, the fundamental? I, I wrote back to this one guy, and I says, this is the most basic fundamental thing you will ever get as to why all the statutes that you are going and using fail to be productive in what you're doing. You can't use the statutes uh, against them in their courts that are controlled by the man that controls all courts, which is their final resting place to quell anything that you might have administrative or legislatively done to do to get yourself out of the system. And <clears throat> if you go to court, you lose. And I even put two particular cases in here in the book, which I quoted uh, right out of the uh, New History of America, and that was uh, the Templeton and the, and the Slater case, where the court um, come right out and said um, that uh, Templeton did not, <coughs> um, well, it's page on page uh, 54. And this is what the court said uh, in the Templeton case. <clears throat> Finally, we addressed Templeton's second argument in which she claims she is not a person liable or a taxpayer, as those terms are defined in the Internal Revenue Code. Oh, by the way, the Vatican, I am trying and having one hard time, but the Vatican, through all of my research, created the Internal Revenue Service because I have been in constant conflict with the GAO since December 16th when they came out in their audit and said that the IRS is a foreign corporation. They didn't say it was anything to do with the United States, right. the GAO. And I was, had been back and forth, and they clammed right up on me. But anyway, getting back to this, it says, the court says, and this is the judge's quote, Section 6103, do not apply in her case. We agree with the district court that this claim is patently frivolous as Templeton does not dispute that she is a citizen of the United States. And because the code imposes an income tax on every individual who is a citizen or resident of the United States, 
26 CFR 1.1-1A, 1985, it would clearly contradict the plain meaning of the term, not a word, to conclude that Congress did not intend that Templeton be considered as a taxpayer as a term is used throughout the code. End of quote. Now, what I did in my book, I says, I pled with Templeton to argue she is not a U.S. citizen and even sent her my book, Which One Are You? That explains all of this. But she would not heed my advice because, by golly, she was a U.S. citizen and had all the rights that the Constitution said she had and was going to prove she is a sovereign who created the Constitution to protect her. Besides, who was I to express the truth? She knew the truth by the Constitution and myth that told her. She lost, as did Slater, another one. But people, she said to me, after she lost, quote, I should have listened to what you said, end quote. But people have to learn the hard way. It's human nature not to listen to a raving lunatic that goes against 200 years of fraud to bring forth the truth. Yes, they are the Pope's Templars in the federal district courts that are all ecclesiastical courts. Bet you never knew that. Where did they try her? Was that in Arizona or Texas? Uh, no, she's in Michigan, uh, was Minnesota. Michigan? Okay. Min Minnesota, I'm sorry, Minnesota. Yeah, because I remember when that happened, and they just chewed her to bits. Oh, yeah. Yeah, and, and that's why, uh, you know, if you go on, if people really want to go on to ATG Press <clears throat> and look at a synopsis that I wrote in 1998, go to The Big Lie, the beginning of The Big Lie. It's on ATG Press. <coughs> All they have to do is read that as a primer for this book. See, I couldn't put it all together, and I just let it drop after I got out of uh, being a taxpayer in 1998. <coughs> and um, I, I went on leave. You know? I mean, why should I bother? You know, nobody was believing me. Nobody was reading all this stuff that was on ATG Press and putting it into use. There is a man called Nagy that lives down in South Carolina that did take it, and I was told by the people who run ATG Press that this guy is whipping butt big time in a lot of small stuff uh, based on what he read from my stuff on ATG Press. Now, him and one other guy is the only two guy, another guy way out west, his name is Don Wirt. He'll, he'll verify for that because he has not paid an income tax since 1980-something after he read my book. <clears throat> and uh, uh, he, he, he swears by it, and he says he's got all his information from ATG Press and put it to use. And so far, he's about as free as he can get. <clears throat> Again, we've been talking to the I-Man, and the new book out is The Constitution for the United States, The Myth and the Reality. Just who owns the United States? You can order it uh, through PayPal on my website. You can still go back to AGT, atgpress.com and order it if you've done it before uh, the old way. That's still good. No problem with that whatsoever. I just want to end with one thing, if you don't mind, and this could open up another can of worms, but because it is so timely. Okay. The other day, obviously, Obama gave uh, his speech before uh, Congress. And he yeah, was last in, night. Yeah, this will be last week when they hear oh. this, but that's okay. Uh, yeah, and uh, and he was introduced as the president of the United States. We, we, yeah, right, that's, just tell us why never, that's rich. <laughs> he'll never be um, <clears throat> presented in any way as the president of the United States of America. That's like when he goes before the big Congress and all that, and he goes, and I tell people to look for this. And the crier sits there and says, I now present the President of the United States. And everybody who uh, and claps and waves. He never says America. The reason why, if he was the President of all of America, all of the states, every governor would have to go to the President for any bill passed and get him to sign off on it. So he can't be the President of the conglomeration of states of the corporation of the Pope, because that's why they installed all governors. All right, so when he, what is the United States that he's president of? That little uh, corporation structure, the mother corporation, 
as would be GM over Chrysler, uh, over uh, all the uh, Chevy products. In other words, Washington, D.C. Right. was a corporation way before uh, everybody erroneously believes was done in uh, 1871. Right. When everybody's oh, that's when the that was when it was formed as a corporation. No, it wasn't because I've got the documents going back to 1826, when Alexandria, Washington City, uh, Georgetown went bankrupt, and who bought them out? Of course, the Pope through his United States Congress assembled. They were his front men at that time, besides the president. So here you had uh, those companies <clears throat> going bankrupt, and in 1826 to 1834, the the Congress came in. They didn't have a lot of money, right? Uh huh. Uh, there was so much money back to the British <clears throat> uh, bank that. Uh, they were almost bankrupt themselves. So how did they have the money to buy up Georgetown, Alexandria, Washington City, um, and, and surrounding areas and buy their bankruptcy up so that they wouldn't go bankrupt and continue to operate them where they finally settled in Washington, D.C.? Because you look at Washington, D.C., Alexandria is up there in the upper right-hand corner or left-hand corner when you look at the 10-mile square. Right, but it's across the Potomac and it's, and it's not a part of D.C., right? Right. Now. Yeah. Now it is. <clears throat> um, but uh, that's that, <laughs> that's why he can't be called the President of the United States of America. Because the little word of means belonging to or emanating from... A larger... Yeah. Right. A larger thing. So America is the nation. Not the United States of America, America right. uh, not the states, not the uh, North American continent where they have United States, Canada, and Mexico written on the original maps, or, well, on the original map, before the United States was formed, it was America where the United States is now. So America is the nation belonging to, well, the United States. <coughs> Um, it's the same way as the city of London. Uh, it's not a British corporation. It's not a British entity at all, the landmass. It's a private, of its own corporation in England, and that's why they call it the Bank of England, the bank belonging to England on the soil. The same way with the Vatican. Did you know that the Vatican had just now has told the Italian government that it is a foreign nation and it is seceding from Italy and will no longer follow Italian law. It is a law unto itself. It used to be in 1921, and then they made a deal with Italy, I don't know how, but they became uh, subject to Italian law. And when this new pope went in, he says, no more, guys. We own you. We own every land. We own... Forget about it. We own it. We own you. We are a sovereign nation, and it's right posted on the newspapers. And it was in, I think, uh, uh, one of the big, um, like, U.S. News. And U.S. Today or something like that? Yeah, USA something like Today. that. Yeah, that wasn't yeah. that long ago that that happened. It was like, what, a month No, that, or so. that was in January. Yeah, I remember, yeah. yeah. Oh, well, you know, I mean, even the United States has two ambassadors, one to uh, Italy and one to the Vatican. Yeah, they have ambassadors to the Vatican, right. And inside the Vatican, too, I think there's another nation state, which is the Knights of Malta. Yeah, yeah. And and if you look at the organizational structure, that is controlled by the Illuminati, the Knights of Malta. That's a, another separate right. entity of its own belonging to the Pope. Uh, just let me clear up one other thing before we go. The original purchase for the land of Washington D.C. was right. to, was to comprise uh, uh, what a ten mile square area that would have been a square had it extended across the Potomac. Correct? Yeah, but it doesn't now because um, uh, when I found out, <coughs> uh, 
what the square mileage is, uh, it's about two-thirds of what it said, uh, and it came from um, the uh, archivist that I talked to in um, uh, Washington, D.C., and they had sent me an email and said it's it's no longer ten miles square, it's it's uh, two thirds of that. <laughs> Which is why we see it drawn the way we do. Yeah, yeah. Where it's truncated, like it's almost cut on the oil. Oh, it's cut by the the Potomac. Uh huh. All right. Okay. Yep. Was that archivist in the Library of Congress? Do you know? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, and uh, if the people want to know, they can go uh, February eighteen thirty six twenty fourth Congress. The House of Representatives Report Number 269, Relief to the Corporations of Washington, Alexandria, and Georgetown, District of Columbia. It was uh, accompanied the bill H.R. Number 275. <clears throat> and right there it, uh, is a committee for the District of Columbia to which we referred a memorial of the corporations of Washington, Georgetown, and Alexandria, praying that relief may be afforded them in their pecuniary embarrassments, have had the same under consideration and ask leave respectfully to submit the following report. And in there it gives the whole report, um, how many, um, uh, <clears throat> well, Alexandria had a debt for the Holland Loan and sundry other debts of uh, 405,148 dollars and 49 and three quarter cents. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right. And the entire debt of the corporation is 477,776 dollars. Washington City was 1,896,079 dollars. And this is what was bought up of the three corporations, and they even says statement of the debts of the three corporations. And, of course, that includes Georgetown, which is uh, the headquarters of the Pope, more yeah. or less, in the United States, and that's that's where they tried uh, John Surratt and got a hung jury. Uh -huh. Interestingly, and his confessor was, <laughs> was Bernard Wiggett from yep. uh, Baltimore, another big uh, Jesuit city. And, and uh, <clears throat> you know... So I've got all these documents, and a lot of a lot of patriots would call or email me and say, "Oh, you're full of it and everything." So I just make a copy of this and I send it to them, and they shut right up. They don't know what to say. Well, you know, yeah. it's it's all myth. They're all following myths. Oh yeah, and that has been 220 years in the making, and so everybody, uh, you know, you get a uh, a person today who was born in 1960. Uh, 1965, 1980, 1990, they have no clue of what is going on. All they do is parrot what they hear from their parents who are just as well into the myth and the fraud because they didn't know that their ignorance is be pales anything known to man. And it's done that way purposely. It, you know, they're, they're not ignorant on their, well... I say they're angry because they don't question anything. Well, they, they follow. Well, the, the irony okay. of it, if you'll if you'll allow me, is this: when I came into this, uh, I was a victim also of sanitized history textbooks and, and uh, books from mass pub, uh, mass publishing uh, houses. Oh, that, I that, was too. Yeah, I was too. But now, you know, I got it. But then I went further. And, it's, mm -hmm. and, and here's the wall that you hit. And then these people who are listening to show hosts that are telling them that the Constitution is, you know, we got to get it back. We have to get our country back. They know that what they read was, was bogus in history books, but they're going to hang on to this one particular fable because they need to. Yeah, now here's what I put in the book. <clears throat> it's on page three. Theory of Cognitive Dissonance. Yeah. Leon Fester, Stanford University Press, 1957 holds that the mind involuntarily rejects information not in line with previous thoughts or actions. Festinger observed, a person can deal with the pressure generated by changing the dissonance of the old behavior to harmonize with the information. That would be the truth. Right. But if a person is committed to the old behavior and way of thinking, 
He simply rejects the new information. A simple, quote, I don't believe it, end quote, thought or word is an easy cop-out. For if you are unaware, you are unaware of being unaware. <laughs> and, and Thomas Paine had it nice. Reason and ignorance, the opposites of each other, influence the great bulk of mankind. If either of these can be rendered sufficiently extensive in a country, that's ignorance, <laughs> yeah. the machinery of government goes easily on. Reason obeys itself, and ignorance submits to whatever is dictated to it. The rights of man, Thomas Paine. You know, that's where we're at now. Yeah. Ignorance is not a state of not knowing. When reason is present, but the knowledge is lacking, the term frequently refers to nothing other than the lack of knowledge. This lack of knowledge can be corrected. It is a willfully ignorant mind, one that is purposely closed and unaccepting of knowledge that undermines his views of the world, that we will have a very difficult time accepting the simple facts presented in this book. That's how I started it out. Uh, let me end with this, because uh, I thought it was funny, so to speak, back then. I believed it to be partially true, and I realized that it was, but uh, it probably is the single word you could use for the history of the world, and that was the beginning of the movie Reds, where Warren Beatty plays the character of uh, the communist at that time. And I'm not going to remember his name. Uh -huh. uh, but uh, they ask him at a uh, big dinner. He's sitting at the dais. And they ask him if he would tell everybody uh, what that war, that Bolshevik war was about in Russia. And he stood up with that stupid grin of Warren Beatty's. <laughs> and he said, you remember this? He goes, profits. And he sat right, back down. Yeah. <laughs> and that's yep. really what it comes down to. And uh, it's John, and I, I, I can't remember, uh, John Reed. That was the actual character. Oh, okay. John Reed, who I believe is buried in Russia, but he was a journalist that went back and forth. And that's, that's, that, that's what opens up the movie Reds. They said, what is it all about? He goes, profits. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> they went yep. back down to dinner. So there you go. That's what it's always about. Forget about, you know, uh, places that are giving uh, liberty to huddle masses. Uh, yeah. It's all about the money. That's right. It's all about the money. So, mm -hmm. Because actually the Vatican is the horror in Revelations. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. When you read Revelations, they fit that to a T. Yeah, and, and uh, also you follow what happens, and that is once uh, the Lord dashes that at Babylon, uh, all of a sudden the captains of industry uh, and profiteering now have mm -hmm. nothing any longer. Right. They're wiped well, out in a minute. Well, that's why all the courts, they're ecclesiastical courts. Remember Howard Freeman? Yes, I do. Okay. You remember when he would have and go to the courts and he said, would put his questions to the court? Well, is this a court of, of this? Or is this a court of this? Is this court this way? He never hit ecclesiastical. That's how well they have hidden it. But the ecclesiastical court, and I've got the three volumes of ecclesiastical law here, and boy, when you start reading that, you can see the Pope all over every court in this country. Well, you know, not every judge or every lawyer is aware of that in the United States. No, of course not. No. Uh, they are just as ignorant as the rest of the American uh, people are on that. And uh, a lot of times, <laughs> well, when, that's... Well, some of them aren't. Some of them are put there. One well-known patriot lawyer, I'm not going to mention names, but he's in that, well, I know that this is, and he would always blast uh, Montgomery any time he could that we ain't Brits. You know, he knows. He's a plant. Sounds like Jerry. <laughs> Uh, well, I'm not going to mention <laughs> not sorry, names, okay. <laughs> I think I know. All but, right. uh, anyway, that's, that's what it is. Now, here is where they come in, and you made a good point, very good point. The ecclesiastical courts operate under what law? Um, There's only one that we, they can operate under, and it was written right into the 1789 constitutional uh, jurisdictional premises. Admiralty. The law of Hammurabi. Oh, which that, is that's right. Going back, right. Yeah. And that, that is admiralty. Am, that, that's it. That's admiralty. The law of Hammurabi is international admiralty. 
and that's what the courts operate under. And why do they do that? Because all revenue is under Admiralty law. And the Jackson and the Magnolia and all these Admiralty cases state it so clearly. But what patriot is ever going to look at an Admiralty case? He ain't. He ain't going to go to American Maritime cases. He ain't going to go to FRD, Federal Rules of Decision, and read the actual cases that are Admiralty based on all revenue. You know, but it does seem to me, and I believe this is an exception you'll tell me, that you might be able to get constitutional rights in, uh, in criminal court. In capital uh, cases. Oh, yeah. Uh, in um, murder, yeah. yeah. Theft, yeah. robbery, assault and battery. They are all... Um, the only thing that really the Pope can't control because it's written into the con constitutions of the Lord and this is what they have one big headache on trying to get rid of because if they got rid of that, <clears throat> there would be anarchy in the courts like you wouldn't believe. You could go up and shoot a judge or kill anybody, and there'd be no repercussions because that's what the Pope wants. Total anarchy. Well, total control. I, I think one of the things we're going to see in time, I mean, the, the, the structure is already uh, being built or has been built. And that is, we're going to go to an international... When I say rule of law, it always gets me, like, nervous because they throw this at you all the time. Mm -hmm. But this international rule of law will do away with juries and it'll all be tribunals as far as I can see. Yeah, yeah, because, <clears throat> see, in Admiralty, in straight Admiralty, there is no jury. And when they do put the juries in, and you read it in Admiralty, it says, in an Admiralty case, a jury is for the conscience of the court. Because then the court could say... If the person found one way or the other, I didn't do it. The jury did it. Right. Right. But in all revenue cases, you really don't have a right to a jury in a criminal action because now they can say it's theft, and it is because the people don't understand. Um, uh, you're using private Federal Reserve notes that have a lien on them already, which are debt IOUs. And you are using the debt IOUs to further your uh, agenda of making money, and it ain't money. And in fact, um, <clears throat> the congressman was on the internet, and the guy sent it to me on YouTube of uh, this guy Jan, who was interviewing this uh, congressman, and uh, the congressman actually threw him out of his office. And the guy was asking questions that the average person would ask which was not right, and the congressman kept saying, you don't understand this, you don't understand this. This is a nation, and nations do not have debts like personal people. They are uh, our money. Debt is our basis of living yeah. as a nation. Right. And he says it has no bearing on what you're arguing here, about the debt and shouldn't we pay the debt down and why are you going to borrow so much money? And the guy says, well, if you're going to borrow $8 trillion or 800 and some billion dollars on a $5 trillion debt, uh, then, you know, and he's going on. And I could see the congressman getting madder and madder because I understood what the congressman was saying to this guy. But this guy is like the average American and believe that the government should operate as they do and pay their bills when it is and not spend a lot of money. But that is not how the Pope operates. Okay. I have since <clears throat> stopped calling the government a government because it is a corporation. It is all that people have ever been dealing with in their entire lives is a corporation under corporate law and not a social government law that everybody believes this country is under today. That'd be the state or the federal. Because, if, you, like I said, 
if you take the word federal and go to a Webster's Dictionary, the word federal means contract. So anytime you have federal income tax, federal government, federal rules of decision, re replace the word federal with contract, okay. right. and that's what you are dealing in, contract. <laughs> All right, I mean, listen, thanks a lot for staying with us uh, over as usual. I appreciate it. Again, the book is The Constitution for the United States, A Myth and the Reality. Just who owns the United States. And you can go through PayPal on my site. You can also go to atgpress.com. And there's other books he's written there as well. Another one of my favorites, uh, which I have always up my ready, is The New History of America. But there's more out there as well. All right, Ahmed, thanks a lot for being with us. Okay.